So hi, my name is Sukho. So I'm going to talk about two things today, uh, both tools that I built with a, a fantastic team at TomTom. Uh, Tom. Um, the first tool is called MapMetrics, and what that is about is uh, providing um, an open insight into the, the uh, routability and connectivity of OpenStreetMap data for, for vehicle navigation, primarily. And the second is Roadrunner, which is a system to automatically build a map. Um, so the first is map metrics. I'm going to explain how this thing works, and please feel free to shout out questions if you want. Um, I've just picked a random place in the world, and I have a GPS trace, right? And this GPS trace here is represented by the little red dots of someone driving along. What map metrics does is take GPS traces like this, but on a vast scale, like billions and billions of traces all over the world. But this is just one trace to give you an idea of how the thing works. What we do is we route from the beginning and end to the trace. So the route might look like this. So we have someone took the route that basically represented by the red dots with all of the inaccuracies and trouble that GPS has. And then the routing engine tells you, well, you should follow the blue route. What we do is we measure the distance um, along the route from each point to where it would be projected onto the route. Not the nearest point on the route, but the distance it would be down as you drive along. We take the median of that and uh, color in a map of the world. And we do this for billions of traces. So in this particular case, the, the left hand of the route adheres fairly well to the map, right? So the, the points are close to the route. And on the right, they're far away. And this can happen for a lot of different reasons. The GPS can be bad, the map data can be bad, the routing engine can do something wacky. Um, there's millions of reasons why this can be so, but it's like a... Um, uh, a third party independent sort of view into map quality because we're using what real people drive. And if you average it out over lots and lots of uh, GPS traces, what you do is you remove the noise, right? So what you try to do is get to just where the map is bad for some value of bad. So it is global. Um, I'm going to zoom in on, I think, the Netherlands. Um, and you can see, maybe depending on how good this, yeah, the lighting's a little bad, but basically, um, the, the redder the, the tile here as we zoom in, uh, the further away the GPS is away from the route. So when you go all the way in, it starts to look like this, sort of like, I call it melted gummy bears, but um, you get this patchwork of red and green areas. The green areas, again, was where we think the routing is good, quote good, red is where it's bad. If you go all the way in, um, we provide this uh, tile service that you can click on. Um, each one of these things is a Web Makeda Zoom 16 tile. Um, and you can see that there's a red tile in the middle, that means the routing's bad, but there's also yellowy, orangey stuff to the you know, north, south, east, and west of that. And so this is just to give you an example of, of what a, a bad map looks like. So you can see that there's uh, map data on top, there's imagery underneath, and you can see that the intersection is basically in the wrong place. right? And so the maximal badness is going to be in the middle because that's where the routes deviate the most. And then you can see that basically the roads are both misaligned and it tells you exactly where they are. As another example, um, here's just one on its own um, out in, in the middle of nowhere. And I'll, I'll take a short thing to say here that map metrics performs best where there's fewer roads because it's easier to see what the problem is basically. Um, and in this particular case, so you can click on it and it gives you a bunch of information I should also talk about. So it gives you the uh, location of the tile in Web Mercator coordinates, and then it gives you the average, median, and median count. Um, and what these are, the average and the median are, are units of meters, so it's how far away the uh, trace is from the uh, route in meters, and the average median values of those two things. And then the median count um, multiplies the median distance by the number of, of traces that we have in that cell. So the reason for that is if you have two traces, uh, sorry, two cells, and they're both, let's say, 100 meters away on, on average or on the median, if one of those cells has 3 million people drive through it every day and the other one has five, we want to bias towards the one where there's lots of people driving through. And the reason for that is so that you can focus on the places that impact people the most, because it's where people are. Um, so if you click, you can go uh, go edit it, and you can see pretty clearly immediately what the problem is. So we have a road coming down from the north, and on the satellite imagery, you can see the, the track keeps going, but for whatever reason, the data goes um, off to the east. 
one more little example. Within TomTom, Tom, we have the uh, advantage of having GPS data. And so just to demonstrate that, um, unfortunately, we can't make that GPS data public, uh, which is one of the reasons that MapMetrics is made as a, as a proxy for it. Um, but you can see if you have a red tile and you have like eight roads, it's already difficult to start figuring out what exactly is the problem. And of course, GPS is much more useful here. And it's not clear that you'd be able to, even with it, aerial imagery, see some of these things, especially in wooded areas. So in this particular case, you can see that there's a couple of um, uh, places that aren't on the map. I'll just flip between them a couple of times so you can see that there's traces that people are taking that uh, aren't represented by the map data. And now what I'm going to do is what you should never do. <laughs> so let's see if this works. Um, hopefully this is showing the screen the correct way. Good. So um, here's an example I completely randomly picked. But you can see that uh, this is actually not far from here. I'll zoom out and then show you some better examples in a second. But here's an area of red. Uh, you can see you're going, going uh, down here. You can click the tile. It says the median count is super high. The average is about 132 meters away from the, the roads. You can click to edit an ID. Um, and there you go. And it's pretty clear what the problem is. There's a road. Uh, it's misaligned, but you can also see there's entire neighborhoods that have been built uh, and roads that are, don't make sense. This might be some sort of wacky old tiger data or something that's still in OSM. Um, and maybe I'll just pick a couple more while I'm here. Uh, I've completely lost where I am. So here's Tucson, right? So as we zoom in, there's going to be a bunch of misalignment in Tucson, but again, it's much easier to pick stuff that's out in the middle of nowhere. Um, if anyone wants to pick something, let me know. But I'm going to be dangerous and just pick this and see what happens. So this is a good one. This is a footpath um, that vehicles are clearly driving down. That's my first guess. My second guess is that there's a, a highway track that's next to it, or the footpath should be highway track. Um, one of those two things. And to me, that looks like a highway track that's been mis, uh, mistagged as a footpath, or maybe it actually is a footpath and people are legally driving down it. Um, either way, there are definitely cars driving down there that you could go fix if, if you wanted. Uh, I'll pick this red cell all the way on its own, and this is one that might blow up in my face. Let's see. Uh, so, I'm just going to orient myself here for a second. So there's this little loop, and it's a red cell, and the numbers looked high to me. Yeah, super high. So, oh, you can see what it is. So there's a, tr there's a highway track back here. I, that's what it looks to me. And also these driveways. So another thing is long driveways or heavily trafficked driveways are going to be picked up. Um, so you can see there's a bunch of uh, unpaved driveways and probably people drive four by fours behind here is my guess. Um, and I'll do one more just because I can. All right, so this is gonna be hard because there's nothing. Um, but given the environment, my guess is more highway four by four tracks. Yeah, so the road is so we've got a road that's misaligned here, and four by four tracks or highway or uh, I don't know maybe there's a special name in Arizona, but everyone calls them differently in these different places. Yes, live demo that actually worked. <laughs> um, so you can play around. What what I'm trying to show you and convince you of is you can pick an area. Of, and fairly rapidly find things to fix, which is the whole point of map metrics. Um, and by providing a feedback loop of where the map is, you know, quote bad, you can go fix things very rapidly. All right. Yes. Good. All right. So the second thing I'm going to tell you about is called Roadrunner. And the way I'm going to explain this is by um, stealing some content from Tesla. So. Uh, this was presented at Tesla's AI Day eight or nine months ago or something, um, which is well worth a watch. It's a very long video, but they presented everything that they've been working on um, and what they're going to do. And what you're seeing is two different cars. You can pick a side uh, of the screen, it doesn't matter. And on the bottom, you're seeing five of the eight cameras uh, on a Tesla as it's driving around. Um, and so it has cameras pointed uh, forward and then obliquely forward and back on the sides and then there's a camera on the back as well. And you can see what it's doing is essentially making a map. Well, that's what it's doing for me. Um, 
So as it's driving around, you can kind of see this probability space get firmed up as it drives, as it figures out where the roads are, even the roads off to the side that aren't the ones that it's driving on. And you can see two different examples of this, right? One on the left, one on the right. And uh, what it shows to me is the, uh, the possibility that in the future, we're not going to be making maps anymore. We're just going to have computers do it. Because if you wrote the right software and those cameras are good enough, then you could take a couple weeks or a couple months of data from all the Teslas driving around and you could make a fairly complete map for the purposes of vehicle navigation um, just by pressing a button if you had that software. So you could replace you know, the multi-decades of different um, types of maps that we've tried to build in the world just with computers at the end state. And I think that's probably the way the world's going to go at some point, at least for vehicle navigation. It doesn't do parks, it doesn't do airports and so on. Um, but it does point to the idea that all this stuff is going to get automated, which is sort of the story of the world, is automation. Um, so, uh, while at TomTom, Tom, the, the thought was, could we do the same thing with GPS data? And so this is the same place I showed you on the very first slide, um, just showing you different uh, GPS traces colored by direction of travel, and width is roughly indicative of how many cars are on it. And so could you take this data, put it through some sort of magic box and turn it into a map? That's the, the basic question. Um, and the short answer was yes. So we spent a bunch of time on this. Not only can you get uh, the road geometry, but you can also get the classification by the, the speed of the vehicles and how many of them uh, traverse each road segment. So it's not perfect by any means. This is France um, showing essentially the, the motorway network. Um, you can see that there's a bunch of stuff that's been mis- categorize this motorway, there's little bits missing here and there, and this is by no means perfect, but you can get the road geometry out fairly quickly. I, I don't remember where these places are, I guess this is Paris, yeah. Um, and then similarly with Spain, I'm going to zoom in and show you some examples of, of the, the road network. Um, so one thing that's super wacky on the left hand side here is, uh, you might see all this noise down over there, yeah down here, that's basically where tunnels uh, the tunnels are in Madrid, and so those tunnels are super bad for the GPS traces and make the, all the models blow up. Um, so just to you know, reiterate that this is sort of terrible, but it also sort of kind of works pretty well. So this is a random intersection somewhere in America, and you can see that not only have we automatically figured out what we think the road classification is, we've also figured out the direction of travel, and we're making something that's um, comparatively routable as OSM for most places. In fact, our metric for success was using map metrics all over again on this to see where it, um, where it uh, landed compared to uh, OSM data. And the, the whole goal was to improve the algorithms to the point where it spit out a map that was as good as OSM, completely automatically using GPS data. Um, here's another example. And what I'm going to start to do is, you, again, the screen might not be super good here, is yes, we can produce a road network but what about everything else that goes into a map, like road names, turn restrictions, uh, airports, and so on? And the answer, I think, is uh, for this particular use case, uh, we started to pull in OSM data. So this is the road network is automatically generated, but we pulled in uh, road names from OSM. And again, it's hard to see on these screenshots. I think this is one of the best ones I have that you can see. Look, Windsor Drive and Isle View Drive. So we started pulling in those uh, road names automatically from OSM. And then you could imagine you could pull in uh, that data from other places, proprietary sources, uh, the, the daylight distribution. Uh, you could pull in buildings from one of the various global buildings data sets. Um, you could pull in things like parks from OSM. And then you could splice these together, and it wouldn't have to be global, right? So maybe you pull in uh, commercial data sources in North America or something and then you just use wholly OSM where you don't have GPS traces but then the places in between you could automatically generate a map or at least use it to check things. Um, and so my final couple of slides I'm just going to show you some of the places where it breaks. Um, I hope you can see that the, the road names and one-way streets are on there and they're like relatively accurate but we have things like this this junction that isn't correctly modeled um, we have this as a one-way street, and it's actually not. It's People go one way through there all the time, but it's not actually one way. Um, and you can see that we're also capturing these sort of slip road lanes where um, officially, if you looked at OSM, there isn't, there isn't that sort of little connector piece, but the GPS is high fidelity enough that it thinks that there's a road there, um, just to give you an example of sort of what's possible. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening.